Hey guys, I have been thinking a lot about the state of movies and about movie going lately. If you have ever seen an update before, you know I'm a big fan of going to the movies. It's what I like to do most with my time and it's what I spend most of my disposable income on. And things seem to be changing a little bit in the theatrical movie going arena. But I think it's important to not have control over what you're watching. You know, that's, it's gonna play whether you're there or not. You can't pause it to run and do something. It's just gonna go. If you want to experience it, you have to be there at that moment to experience it. And it's so big and it's so loud and that's the way it should be for, for me. And you have to give yourself over to it and you have to schedule your day around it and you, then you have to just focus on it. And that's why when I hear like a great modern storyteller like Tessa Violet say something like, I'm recognizing lately that I have an attention issue, specifically in the media that I'm consuming. I find myself watching SVU and playing Two Dots because it's like I don't want to actively engage in one thing. And I know it's not good for me. I know it doesn't help my anxiety to need to be uh, constantly stimulated in more than one way. At this point in my life, I would never see a movie if it wasn't someone else's idea. Part of my complex is thinking, two hours? What if I'm bored? <laughs> it's so terrible. <laughs> Every time I watch that clip, I get a little bit of a panic attack. I think Tessa is super, super talented and the way that she deals with pacing and tone, like it's great. And I always kind of figured someone who's so good at pacing her videos and her edit and so great at creating like a kind of a cool tone that someday I'd be seeing a Tessa Violet movie. But I realized that that's just because I'm a movie lover and not everybody has to like movies and a lot of great visual storytellers are working outside of the realm of movies now. And to hear someone that I thought was such a great filmmaker care so little about movies just kind of blew my mind. Tessa was making that video in response to an amazing video that Hank Green did on the Vlogbrothers channel. There is so much media now. Oh my God, how do we consume it all? About wanting to engage more fully in the content that he was watching. To choose some things to be really passionate about and to not worry so much about consuming like a bunch of little snack-sized media. I know he wasn't talking about movies. He was talking about all forms of content. It was an amazing video. That's also linked in the dubs. Every video I mention is gonna be linked in the dubs today. Even though he's talking about all forms of content, uh, being a movie devotee myself, I, I kind of thought about the way things are going with movies and big budget studio filmmaking. And even though I love to go to the movies, I don't have unlimited resources. I have to pick and choose what I'm going to go see. And a, a lot of the time lately, it has been revival cinema, movies that are being rescreened from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Movies that I love, movies that I've always meant to see, but that they're remaking anyway, you know? And instead of going to see the remake, I'd rather go see the original when someone was like truly excited about the idea and wanted to show you something that you hadn't seen before. But sometimes I get super excited about the zeitgeist surrounding a movie and everybody's talking about it because I follow a lot of movie sites and a lot of movie reviewers and a lot of people who just really love movies, directors, and people start talking about a current movie and I have to go see it. And so when the trailers came in for The Suicide Squad, I was super excited about it. Those trailers were awesome. But then when all those bad reviews started coming in, I was like, Meh. I'll wait for Redbox, if anything, you know? Until several people on YouTube that I really am interested in and that really respect piqued my interest with their comments. That's storytelling, I guess. It's like, whose perspective is this film from? Who are we following? Why do we care? Why does this make sense with the plot that we're seeing? What's the theme? What are we exploring? What's going on? I don't even have the, God, I don't even have the fire for this. I just don't care. It's just out of me. <laughs> Should I get a new, new job? I feel like I should get a new job. I'm having an existential crisis while filming this. <laughs> like, I just can't. I just can't. Oh, I can't anymore with these movies. Like, it's just killing me. It's killing me to try to explain them, why they're bad. It kills me that people think that they're great. I, and I just, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know what to do. It's the same arguments, round and round we go, you know? Like, you guys just don't give a shit about storytelling, you know? Just make it look cool, oh, you know? The trailers for this movie were pieces of art in and of themselves. Um, from what I understand, they might have helped 
shape the movie a little bit later on regardless. So I started to think that maybe the problems in Suicide Squad would be emblematic of the larger problems in big studio filmmaking today, especially if what Kevin Smith was saying was true about them recutting a movie based on the trailers that were successful on the internet, because that is crazy. <laughs> it's actually, it's not that crazy if you think about the way that people are treating trailers on YouTube these days. It's like content itself. Even though a trailer is a different art form, actually a marketing tool, it's being treated as content. There's trailer review videos. Movie reviewers are reviewing movie trailers. Trailers are being treated like content, like it's content itself, which makes sense because it's, there, some of them are longer than other videos we watch on the internet and that's all content, so why aren't trailers content in and of themselves? Trailer reaction videos, people watching the trailer and just filming their reaction makes a lot of sense. I did that whole video about the React channel earlier. I love watching people react to things because you can see how the beats of this thing really affect them and you can apply that to your own work. And then when people get mad about an amazing trailer not giving enough away. Show me something. Damn it. Damn, damn, damn. I knew it. I, this is why I didn't want to watch this trailer because JJ Abrams does this. Damn it, JJ. Eh, he does this. <clears throat> that trailer, the 10 Cloverfield Lane trailer, was the greatest trailer and they gave you everything. They gave you the tone, they gave you the general plot of the movie, they give you great imagery and a ton of intrigue, all right? And so that is exactly what a trailer is supposed to do. So when you say, G show me something, if they showed you anything, when you go to the movie, then you say, ah, I saw it in the trailer. The purpose is to get you to go see that movie, all right? It's a marketing tool. Okay, I'm getting a little. I'm getting a little crazy about the trailer thing, so let's move on from there. So I thought Suicide Squad might be a good gateway in to me exploring my thoughts on current big budget filmmaking, uh, but I needed to see it first. I couldn't just take everybody's word for it. I had to go see it and talk about it from a place of actual experience. But I was hesitant because it's true what they say. You tell Hollywood what you want to see with your money. By paying to go see something, you are supporting it. That's why I went to see Green Room in the theaters twice and BVS in the theaters zero times because if it's anything like Man of Steel, I don't want it. I thought, what's the, what's the least amount of money I can spend on a first run movie? Well, it wasn't in any second run movie theaters yet. And I thought, you know what? There's a drive-in movie theater. You pay $10, you see two movies. That's $5 to see Suicide Squad. $5 less than the 10 plus that you're gonna pay to go see it in any other movie theater. Yeah, I can, I can, I can live with that. So I went. You guys, I love the drive-in, and I've said it on this channel before, it's not the ideal way to see a movie, especially the first feature is a little blown out because the sun hasn't fully set the beginning of it, but this one that I went to, the Cascade Drive-In, has been a gathering ground for people to come be with big, big cinema since 1952. Okay, it takes me like over an hour to drive to any drive-in movie theater from where we live. So I left with plenty of time to get there, and I ended up being one of the first people there, and I was a little worried that nobody was gonna show up because it was a weeknight and it seems like gathering in real life as a community around an activity is less and less of a priority for people these days unless you can get some kind of individual digital credit for it. But even if nobody had showed up, I still love it. I love the feel of the drive-in. I love how much has happened at that drive-in. I love the big screen and I love the concession stand so much. The concession stand is weird, man. <laughs> it's, 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 there's so many weird little specific things that belong to drive-in movie culture that have been around for forever and still exist in these old drive-in movie concession stands. And by Showtime enough people had shown up that there was that like event energy, like seeing a movie with a bunch of strangers that I really love about going to see a movie uh, at a drive-in or at a theater. Like it's that event energy that surrounds it. So I settled in, check out Suicide Squad. And it was not the complete disaster that I expected. The beginning plays a lot like a comic book movie. I mean, it, like an actual comic book, like all the quick character recaps. I can see that being straight out of a comic book. You meet this character, you have a few panels about their history, and then you're into the story. It felt very much like an actual comic book. And then the second half plays out like a military mission movie, which is smart. I mean, Marvel has been doing that trick forever. You keep superhero movies interesting by having each movie be from a slightly different subgenre, political thriller, action comedy, space comedy. The problem actually with Suicide Squad is that the dialogue is all pretty trite and expected and it's just one fight after the other fight and the fights aren't very interesting. And then they try to have this group of villains, which was the exciting thing about Suicide Squad, they try to have this tacked on friendship and loyalty to each other 
that feels so forced. And the biggest problem is, is the Joker. Jared Leto's Joker feels like the douchebag son of the boss of the Joker company. And he's only in power because his daddy created everything. And he's walking around being smarmy. I dig the look. I dig what they did with the look of the Joker, but Leto's performance was awful. Even though Suicide Squad didn't end up feeling like, like big budget filmmaking made for internet interest, which is what I thought it was going to be. And that's what I thought was going to be my point. It wasn't. The only thing that Suicide Squad really pointed out about tentpole filmmaking is just stuff that we have known for a while. It's that studios think that large scale digital destruction can replace interesting characters and good dialogue and looking for something that we haven't seen before, which we've known for a while. That is no surprise to us. They've been doing that to us for quite a few years now. They don't want any fresh takes, just repackaged takes that you recognize as something that's already happened. That's all they want. They, they, something that has recently made money, they want that for their studio and they want to put it in front of you again. Given that, <laughs> I guess that I can't be too surprised that the next generation of really interesting visual storytellers are not that interested in movies because movies are not interested in showing you anything new. It does make me sad though. And there's a lot of great movies. They're just made for no money and nobody can make a sustainable living making them. Anyway, I actually need to spend less time going to the movies and talking about the movies and more time working on Pops. Now that we're home from a vacation, I have done a little bit of work on that and I've been working on this really long rotoscoping shot, but I need to stop rotoscoping. It's, it's getting in my head. I need to go work a little bit more on the episode and then I'll come back to this roto shot. So you guys are great. That's what I've been thinking about this week. That's the Pops logo. Hope you have a great week. Bye.